There is an island in the Southern Sea. To its north is the vast continent of Australia. Far to the south, there is nothing but ocean until Antarctica is reached. Here in the roaring 40s, New Zealand lies to the east. And far away to the west, the next landfall is South America. The island is Tasmania, Australia's smallest and southernmost state, an island so beautiful, so diverse in its nature, that it has long held a magnetic attraction to visitors, not only from the Australian mainland, but from overseas too, and increasingly so as the word spreads. Tasmania's first official visitor was a captain of the Dutch East India Company, Abel Tasman. He discovered the island in 1642 and named it Van Diemen's Land. But it was not until 1803 that the island was settled by the British, who, 15 years earlier, had established their first Australian colony, Sydney Town, on Botany Bay. As a means of solving the problem of overcrowded cities, Poverty and the resulting high crime rate, brought about to a large extent by the Industrial Revolution, Britain transported many thousands of its lawbreakers to Australia. The life of the convicts, the jailers, the soldiers and the free settlers is mirrored today in the settlement at Port Arthur, where many of the ruined buildings are preserved and cottages and administration buildings faithfully restored and furnished. The aim of the Port Arthur Historic Site Management Authority is to maintain the historical integrity of the site. Over the years, the buildings suffered from the disintegration of brick and stone due to the weathering, made worse by the poor quality of the original materials and attack by the corrosive seaside environment. New techniques were adopted to stabilize the large ruins. Bricks from the tops of ruined walls were refired to help them resist decay. Walls were damp-proofed and a stainless steel reinforcing system inserted.
they'd all be kept out there in the uh, assembly yard or the muster yard. Have a look up towards the uh, hospital, and at the bottom of those steps there is where the uh, uh, the triangles, the flogging post, was placed. So for those who behaved, convict life in Van Diemen's Land was far preferable to life at the time in Britain, where for many, squalor and starvation was all that could be expected. Many convicts served their time and eventually became free settlers, contributing to Van Diemen's Land's prosperity and themselves becoming prosperous. In terms of today's standards, life for the convicts at Port Arthur was cruel and hard, with its solitary confinement cells and the frequent punishment of the lash. But in the 1840s, the British philosophy of prison life changed in the belief that hard work under constant supervision in isolation and silence was a better way to reform criminals rather than such physical punishment as the lash. At Port Arthur, the model or separate prison was thus built its solitary cells, separate exercise yards and face masks reinforcing the regime of solitude and silence. Many visitors find their way too to the old Richmond jail whose history parallels that of Port Arthur. In the 1820s, Richmond was the colony's third largest community responsible for growing and milling grain and the jail was rather a necessity in view of the large number of convict road gangs, assigned servants and natives whose enthusiasm often had to be contained. Today, Richmond offers the visitor a close look at many historic features. It boasts the oldest Catholic church and the oldest post office in Australia. Its remaining hotel was once one of many inns and taverns, now converted to galleries and private homes. Whilst Tasmania is part of a relatively young country in terms of European settlement, it is nevertheless very conscious of its heritage. In per capita terms, Tasmania has the greatest number of historic buildings of any state in Australia. They are reminders of the architects, engineers and craftsmen who first came to the colony, many of them as convicts. Throughout cities, towns and the beautiful countryside, there are fine examples of the building craftsmanship of the 19th century. A number of mansions have been faithfully restored and furnished and are open for public inspection. An unusual and popular visitor attraction is the Battery Point Walk, a chance to see the elegant homes of the early settlers and the humble cottages of the soldiers, whalers and other colonial workers. The Tasmanian Division of the National Trust welcomes visitors to a number of homes. This one is Runnymede, where once lived a distinguished lawyer. 
later a bishop, then a well-known ship owner. In every room is evidence of the elegance of a bygone age. The furniture, household utensils, fine china, and little reminders of a family growing up through the years. White House at Westbury was a village corner store and bakery. Its stables feature a large collection of penny farthing cycles, carriages and early motor vehicles. Its display of toys is believed to be one of the finest in Australia. Another beautiful home is Clarendon, one of the great Georgian houses of Australia, completed in 1838 for a wealthy wool grower and merchant. Many old homes throughout the state are privately owned and have National Trust classification. They continue as residences or are open to the public as restaurants and colonial style accommodation. The historic village of Evandale receives many visitors. It contains excellent examples of early architecture, churches, cottages, its quaint pubs, museums, art and craft shops. Evandale is the centre for a major folk festival every March when it hosts the International Penny Farthing Championships. An unusual historic building is the Shot Tower, the only remaining stone shot tower in the Southern Hemisphere. It was completed in 1870, and today many energetic visitors take the opportunity to climb to the top. Every city, town, village, even remote rural spots, Tasmanian galleries reflect the superb artistry of its potters, woodworkers, leather, glass and metal workers, its spinners and weavers, furniture makers and painters. It is not only buildings that reflect Tasmania's heritage. There are many other fine structures. It's bridges, for instance. Simple structures crossing the myriad streams throughout the countryside. The unique convict-built spiky bridge near Swansea on the east coast. This bridge at Richmond is Australia's oldest, built by convict labour in 1823. It's said to be haunted by the ghost of a too enthusiastic overseer who met an untimely end at the hands of his convict charges. Famous too is 
the bridge at Ross in the Midlands, convict built with magnificent carvings by convict stonemason Daniel Herbert, ably assisted by his burglar mate, Jem Coldbeck. In all, 50 convicts built the bridge, which has 184 carvings of Celtic symbols, heraldic animals, and well-known figures of the day. Pilfering was a happy pastime in those days, to the extent that even the iron staples on the bridge had to be embossed with the convict broad arrow symbol to prevent theft. Early colonial life is commemorated in many ways throughout Tasmania. In the island's northeast is the old town of Derby. Between 1874 and 1945, it was an important tin mining centre. Visitors to the area find fascination in the Derby Tin Mine Museum with its recreation of a miner's shanty town, office, cottage, general store, butcher's shop, blacksmith's shed, and a working sluice box rig. Not far from Derby is Bridistow Estate, the world's largest singly owned lavender farm. It attracts thousands of visitors every year. From the lavender is distilled true lavender oil, most of which is exported. However, a high proportion is dried for use in an increasingly large range of lavender products. From mining and farming history to memorabilia of a quite different kind at Launceston's National Automobile Museum. Its owners have achieved an international reputation for the restoration of vintage and veteran vehicles, many being retained at the museum for a limited time or on extended loan for the benefit of visitors. On loan from a Hong Kong customer is this 1938 Rolls-Royce Wraith, one of only two ever built. Tasmania is an island of beautiful lakes and rivers. One of its longest rivers is the Derwent, which wends its way from the central highlands down through the fertile Derwent Valley. This is sheep country, famous too, along with the northeast, as a major world producer of hops. The Derwent makes its way south. It passes salmon ponds, where, a century ago, the southern hemisphere's first successful hatching of trout and salmon took place. All Australian and New Zealand fish stock started here, and it continues to operate to this day, one reason why Tasmania has been known for a hundred years as the fisherman's paradise. The commercial center of the Derwent Valley is the town of New Norfolk. Norfolk because it was here that the free people and former convicts of Norfolk Island were resettled after its penal settlement was closed in 1808. Consecrated in 1823, St. Matthew's Church is the oldest church in Australia still in use. The Bush Inn of 1825 is believed to be Australia's oldest continually licensed hotel. Bridgewater is where the first land crossing of the Derwent was made possible. By a little park on the western approach is the old watch house where soldiers and convicts were housed overnight on their long journeys north. Further downstream is one of Tasmania's most popular visitor attractions and at the same time, one of the world's largest and most successful chocolate factories. Each year, some 50,000 tourists are shown over the Cadbury factory where they view the chocolate making process and have the opportunity to taste and to buy.
The Derwent has almost reached the sea, but not before opening up to become Australia's deepest and second largest port, Hobart, Tasmania's capital city. Whilst young Lieutenant Bowen decided in 1803 that the colony's settlement should be further upriver, the state's first governor, David Collins, on his arrival the following year, moved the settlement to Sullivan's Cove. There was a more plentiful supply of water and a better harbour for the many trading and whaling ships, which were soon to begin to play an important part in the island's prosperity. As with any British settlement, there were soon a great many pubs and taverns, and consequently, breweries. Some, like this one at Campbelltown in the Midlands, had a short life. Today, however, Tasmania boasts Australia's oldest brewery, Cascade, its product admired by beer and stout enthusiasts in many parts of Australia and overseas. Adjoining the brewery is its museum, Woodstock, set in beautiful European-style gardens, which are amongst Australia's oldest. The brewery's founder, Peter de Graves, built here the original cottages becoming one single storey and later the two-storey residence. The sparkling waters flowing from Mount Wellington watered Woodstock's gardens, supplied the brewery and made Peter de Graves a wealthy man. So much so that he decided Hobart Town should have a theatre. And today, the Theatre Royal remains the oldest continually operating theatre in Australia. Many famous artists, like Sir Lawrence and Lady Olivia, having performed there. In recent years, Tasmanian wines have become recognised for their superb quality and are now becoming an important export for Tasmania. It surprises many people to learn that Tasmanians have been growing grapes for many years, this giant vine, planted early last century, is the oldest in Australia. Today, almost every visitor to Hobart takes the opportunity to travel to the top of Mount Wellington, enjoying the panoramic views from the pinnacle. The suburban sprawl along the banks of the Derwent, actually made up of three cities, Glenorchy to the north, Clarence across the river, and the city of Hobart nestling below. In winter, Mount Wellington receives its mantle of snow, and with Tasmania's clear blue skies highlighting the surprisingly warm winter sun, young visitors make the most of it. Settled not long after Hobart Town is Australia's third oldest city, Launceston the state's northern capital, nestling in the Tamar Valley, through which the river runs out into Bass Strait. Launceston is proud of its rich architectural heritage, evidenced by its many Georgian and Victorian buildings that have been faithfully preserved and are still in use. Here at Launceston, the John Batman planned the building of what is today Australia's second largest city, Melbourne. Launceston is famous for its beautiful public gardens, which in themselves have a rich history too. This magnificent fountain is believed to be here by accident. It was meant for Launceston in England, but was addressed to Tasmania by mistake. A popular attraction is the Penny Royal Corn Mill and Gunpowder Mill.
Launceston boasts the world's longest single-span chairlift. Just out of Launceston are the Ben Lomond skiing fields, a popular place for skiers of all ages. There's the opportunity to look back to Tasmania's gold mining past at Beaconsfield, just a 20-minute drive out of Launceston. Along the northern coast of Tasmania are many delightful towns and villages. Popular beach resorts like Port Sorrel, Olverston, Boat Harbour and Wynyard. The town of Penguin received its name from the fairy penguin rookeries there and makes the most of this natural attraction. One of Tasmania's most recently proclaimed cities is Burnie on the northwest coast, gateway to the wilderness of the rugged and sometimes impenetrable west and southwest, the rainforests, horizontal scrub, the wild rivers. It was in 1825 that the Van Diemen's Land Company was floated in London with a capital of one million pounds. It's aimed to develop 100,000 hectares of uninhabited land. The first settlement was on Emu Bay, where today Burnie stands. It took many years of back-breaking work by the early British migrants to fight their way through the forests of immense trees to find land capable of pastoral development. The company was administered from the coastal town of Stanley, nestling at the foot of the Nut, the core of an ancient volcano. Today, the citizens of Stanley proudly maintain the rich heritage of the old town. Its other claim to fame is that it was the birthplace of Joe Lyons, the only Tasmanian ever to become an Australian Prime Minister. Today, the Northwest, with its rich chocolate brown soil, is a garden producing much of Australia's potato and other vegetable needs. The lush pastures feed the nation's finest beef and dairy cattle, a very good reason why Tasmanian steaks are an important part of any menu worth talking about and why Tasmanian butter, and in particular cheese, have become such a major interstate and overseas export. Tasmania has developed an important goat breeding industry and the state's spinners and weavers produce high quality mohair garments. But it was sheep which came to Tasmania with the first settlers and it is sheep that have long been of importance to the island's economy. Today the state is internationally known as one of the premier areas for the production of super fine wool. In the past two decades it has consistently achieved world record prices at its wool sales. Its coarser wools supply the raw material for the making of carpet. Quality Axminsters are produced by Tascott Templeman at Devonport. Of historic significance is Waverley Woolen Mills, established in Launceston in 1874 and still producing quality blankets. By 1884, the mill had introduced other weaves and it became the first in the world to be totally integrated the raw fleece entering the factory at one end and emerging as the completed product at the other. During the Second World War, over a million blankets were produced for the forces overseas.
Tasmania's forests have earned many millions of export dollars over the years. Australian pulp and paper mills supplying an important world market with its quality product. Around 40% of Tasmania is forested. Timber and paper products account for more than a quarter of a billion dollars earnings annually. Tasmanian oak is the main timber harvested and exotic species like myrtle and blackwood are in demand for high quality linings and furniture and as veneers. Much of Tasmania's forests are closed to logging. Government owned and private production forests are controlled by the Forestry Commission which is responsible for their management and reforestation as a renewable resource. Forestry has always been important to the state and tourist attractions like the Bush Mill play an important role in recalling the early days of the industry. The Arve Valley in the state's south is an important forestry area and thanks to state and local governments is readily accessible to the public. The Hearts Mountains National Park, Tahoon Reserve and South World Reserve present the opportunity for delightful walks and drives. The Esperance Forest and Heritage Complex at Jeeveston is an excellent introduction to Tasmania's timber industry focusing on the 110,000 hectares of southern production forests. In the state's earlier days, environmental concerns were of little importance. In fact, it must have seemed to many that the state's natural resources were limitless. Consequently, when the West Coast's mineral riches were discovered, and the smelters went into production last century, it was logical that the hills surrounding Queenstown should give up their abundance of hewn and kingbilly pine, myrtle and sassafras to feed the hungry furnaces. The hills denuded, the sulphur fumes killed the undergrowth. The bushfires destroyed what was left. The rain washed the topsoil into the rivers, and the result? The most amazing lunar-like landscape. West Coasters are proud of their mining tradition, despite the fact that market fluctuations in the industry cause concern and heartache from time to time. The museums and conducted tours are an important part of any visit to the area. 
Tasmania is blessed with regions which have great world heritage significance. More than a third of the total land area is designated as National Park State Forest. Visitors can enjoy the state's wilderness in a number of ways, depending on their energy and the time they have to spare. There are bushwalks, wild water rafting and canoeing excursions, mountain climbing, four-wheel drive tours and scenic flights. Each year, many thousands of visitors take the magical cruise on the Gordon River, almost to the point where it meets its tributary, the Franklin, one of Tasmania's most famous wild rivers. The Gordon flows into Macquarie Harbour, on the shores of which is the historic fishing town of Strawn. The Strawn Visitor Centre provides a fascinating glimpse of life on the west coast. The convict era on Sarah Island, the work of the timber fellers and miners, the protests which stopped the building of a dam on the Franklin River, the ships which succumbed to the fury of Hell's Gates, the narrow entrance to vast Macquarie Harbour. In the Northern Highlands, Cradle Mountain has become a highly popular tourist resort, offering excellent accommodation and the chance to view some of the most spectacular scenery in the state. Many thousands of years ago, Tasmania's highland glaciers were replaced by a thousand lakes, varying in size from small ponds to vast waterways like the Great Lake, Australia's largest. It was natural that these should be harnessed to supply electricity to industries the state wished to attract, and to the cities and towns far below in the valleys and coastal areas. Above and below ground power stations were built, in many cases, the same waters driving the giant turbines of a number of stations as the rivers flowed down to the sea. The creation and availability of low-cost hydroelectric power is one reason why air pollution has been less of a problem here than elsewhere in Australia and overseas. It is Tasmania's lakes which, for more than a hundred years, have made the state famous for its trout fishing. It's surprising how many of the world's famous actors, musicians, politicians, artists and industrialists arrive and depart quite anonymously to fish these waters. The waters that rush to the northern valleys provide much more than electricity, fishing, canoeing and rafting. Lake Barrington has become the centre for international rowing competition. From the lake, the waters of the Mersey and Forth Rivers continue to the sea, and to Devonport, first northwest coast town to become a city. There is much to interest the visitor here, in particular, Tiagara, the Tasmanian Aboriginal Culture and Art Centre. Tiagara is the Tasmanian Aboriginal word for keep. This unique center is built to resemble a bark hut and is surrounded by Aboriginal rock engravings. Devonport seems to specialize in historic transport, much to the visitor's delight. Every year, thousands of Tasmanians and visitors enjoy a nostalgic trip on the Don River Railway.
fact, the railway enthusiast is catered for superbly in every way in Tasmania. The Bushmill Steam Railway at Port Arthur is one of the world's great little railways, its scale mirroring the famous little steam trains of Wales. And for those who like to stand and marvel at the precision of model trains, there is Alpenrail, a detailed Swiss electric train system which delights visitors of all ages. There's the model Tudor village, a scale model of an English village, houses, inns, farms, people and their animals. The display is all the more remarkable when one learns that it's the life work of a man crippled with polio from childhood. He used matchsticks, dental plaster, wire and paint to create the delightful model village. On a slightly larger scale is Old Hobart Town Model Village, a faithful recreation of Hobart in 1820. The historically correct village took two and a half years to create, using the original plans from the Tasmanian archives. St David's Church, Government House, the Courthouse, the Jail and the early residences feature with over 400 figurines in authentic period costume. Dotted around Tasmania are a number of wildlife parks which attract visitors by the thousand, eager to see animals and birds, many of which are unique to Tasmania, many of them eager to be fed and cuddled. The Tasmanian devil once roamed widely over mainland Australia, but was extinct there well before European settlement. Its spine-chilling screeches, black colour and bad temper earned it its name from the early settlers. Although only the size of a small dog, it sounds and looks incredibly fierce, its powerful jaws and teeth enabling it to completely devour its prey, fur, bones and all. 
Because the devil had the reputation for taking the early settlers' poultry, stealing animals caught in snares, and making a nuisance of itself amongst newborn lambs, it was almost hunted to extinction. However, it has been predicted by law since 1941. The Tasmanian tiger is said to be extinct, but many bush people believe it could still exist. The last known Tasmanian tiger died in 1936, and since then, large rewards have been offered to anyone who can prove a sighting. Tasmania offers the opportunity to step back in time, a million years and more. In both the north and south of the state are limestone caves. In some past age, carved out by the underground streams which still flow there. The constant drip of water through the limestone has created stalagmites and stalactites, pillars, columns, shawls, in a fairyland spectacle where your imagination can give name to a multitude of nature's carvings. Visitors are fascinated too by the magic of the spectacular glowworm grottos. Captain Cook logged Tasmania's first weather report, describing the climate as the most temperate in the world, a climate without extremes, although there are times when we have heat waves and the occasion when snow settles for an hour or so on suburban lawns. Tasmania has four very distinct seasons. Warm, pleasant summers. Autumns and winters when, more often than not, the chill of night gives way to sparkling, clear, sunny days. And springtimes which transfer the island into a wondrous array of colour. Tasmania is the size of Ireland its population under 450,000. The largest population concentration is Hobart with 140,000 people. Thus the state offers a relaxed lifestyle that is the envy of other Australians. Many families choose to leave the rat race of the big mainland cities to come and live here. It's possible to live in a rural setting yet be only 15 or 20 minutes drive from the city or town centre. Tasmania's education system has always been regarded as one of Australia's best, children having the opportunity to attend kindergarten, primary, high school, college and university with excellent facilities. The countryside is uncluttered, wide open spaces on the plains, in the valleys, the highlands, where you can enjoy the luxury of breathing clean, fresh air. Contained in one relatively small area are all the contrasts of terrain, climate and activity that you'd have to travel hundreds, even thousands of kilometres to find elsewhere. are a warm, friendly people, and they invite you to join in their indoor and outdoor social life, their carnivals, festivals, their culture, and their sport.
Tasmania is perhaps one of the best served states in Australia in terms of sporting facilities. Visitors, for example, can enjoy their golf on delightful courses throughout the state. You're invited to watch Royal Tennis at the Court in Hobart, one of only three in Australia and less than 40 in the world. From Royal Tennis, the first racket game, sprang lawn tennis, because ladies weren't permitted to watch, let alone play Royal Tennis, in the time of Henry VIII. Later came squash, first introduced in the rather confined quarters of the prisons. The first white Tasmanians were almost entirely of British stock, so they brought their eating and drinking traditions with them. Today, Tasmania is far more multicultural, and that's reflected in the wide range of food offered in hotels, restaurants, country cottages, and even the roadside stands. Naturally, visitors like to enjoy meals that reflect the produce of Tasmania. Its fruits, vegetables, meats, dairy products, and of course, its fish, scale and shellfish from its sea and rivers. And from its aquaculture farms, Atlantic salmon, oysters, mussels, abalone, scallops. The state's clean air and pure water make it a perfect center for its aquaculture industry. Tasmanian towns, villages, cities have their popular marketplaces. Very well known is Salamanca Place on Hobart's waterfront, originally the busy shipping offices and warehouses in the early whaling and commercial days of the new colony. Today, the area houses community art centers, craft shops, theaters, restaurants. And every Saturday, Salamanca becomes a fascinating marketplace, thronged by locals and visitors alike as they explore the incredibly wide range of produce offered for sale. Who wants to set the free bob? Tasmania long ago learned that it had to cater for every visitor's needs in terms of accommodation. Thus, today, the full spectrum is covered, ranging from backpackers' rooms and cabins, caravan parks and camping grounds, to private homestay, the traditional Australia pub, motels, right through to international standard hotels. particularly sought after, is colonial accommodation. The opportunity for the visitor to live a part of the state's history by staying in the 19th century cottages, faithfully restored and furnished.
Tasmania was the first state in Australia to introduce legal gambling casinos. And today, Hobart's Rest Point Federal and Launceston Federal Country Club provide a wide range of games to suit both the casually interested and the high flyers. Tasmania, Australia. It's a secret we don't mind sharing in the least. <laughs> 